Hello, and welcome to lecture 11 in the UCL DeepMind lecture series on topics in deep learning. My name is Andriy Mnich, and I'm a research scientist at DeepMind. I work on generative modeling, variational inference, and representation learning. Uh, this lecture will cover modern latent variable models, as well as various types of inference, and in particular, variational inference. So the lecture is structured as follows. I will start by introducing generative modeling and covering the three major types of generative models used in deep learning. Then I will focus on latent variable models, explain what they are, and why inference is so important for them. Then we will cover a special case of latent variable models, invertible models, where we can do exact inference. Then we will move on to intractable models, where exact inference is not an option. And we will look at variational inference for training those models. Variational inference requires estimating gradients of expectations, which is not uh, a trivial problem. So then we will look at how to estimate these gradients. And finally, we will look at a modern application of variational inference to powerful models, uh, which results in variational autoencoders. So let's look at generative modeling. What are generative models? Well, generative models are simply probabilistic models of high dimensional data. So conceptually, they describe the process, the probabilistic process of generating an observation. And we can think of them as uh, me describing mechanisms of generating more data points. And the key distinction between other probabilistic models and generative models is that our uh, distributions that we're modeling are really high dimensional. So in classic uh, settings like classification and regression, you're basically modeling a one dimensional output distribution. While in generative modeling, you're dealing with a high dimensional distribution. And often, you essentially don't have an input. So you're just modeling the distribution of the output. Uh, for this particular reason, uh, generative modeling has been seen as a sub area of unsupervised learning because we're simply modeling the joint distribution of the data and we don't have any labels. On the other hand, if you think about generative models as including conditional generative models, which also have a context, which is quite a bit like an input, then the boundary becomes rather blurry. So it's really more about the uh, technology rather than the actual application it is used for. And there are many types of generative models, and they can handle essentially any type of data, from text to images to video and so on. So let's look at some uses of generative models. The most established and uh, maybe traditional one comes from statistics. And it's called density estimation. And here, we simply fit a generative model to the data in order to get a probability distribution that we can evaluate at any given data point. And once we have this probability distribution, we can use it to uh, actually tell, is this given data point from the same distribution as the training data? Or is it an outlier from some other rather different distribution? This uh, kind of uh, models can be used for applications like fraud detection. There's also a close connection between probabilistic modeling and data compression. So there is actually exact duality between these two uh, areas. So if you actually have a probabilistic model of the data, you can use arithmetic coding to produce a data compressor. We can also use generative models for mapping between two high dimensional domains, for example, between sentences in one language and their translations in another language. So here, the, the sentence in the original language will be the context, and the model will capture the distribution of possible translations for the given sentence. And typically, there will be many possibilities there rather than just a single correct translation. Another exciting application of generative modeling is in model-based reinforcement learning, where the generative model essentially acts like a probabilistic simulator of the environment. So then the algorithms can actually use the simulator to plan uh, optimal sequences of actions 
rather than actually having to try them in the environment to see what happens. And once we've done this planning, we can actually execute the sequence of actions in the real environment. Some types of generative models are really useful for representation learning, where we would like to condense uh, the observations down to, down to some essential features, uh, some sort of low dimensional representations of them that uh, capture the essence. And these low dimensional representations might be more useful than the original observations for downstream tasks such as classification. And often we don't actually know what the downstream, downstream task will be. So it's important to summarize the data in a generic way and generative models provide a way of doing that. And finally, there's this uh, idea of understanding the data that also comes from statistics. Uh, and this is um, the area where the generative model will have a particular meaning to its structure. So the latent variables will potentially be interpretable or the parameters will have some real world significance. So once we train such a model on the data, we can look inside of it using inference, for example, or look at the parameter values, and it will tell us something about the data distribution, something that we can't easily see just by looking at the individual data points directly. So the next uh, few slides are meant to give you a sense of rapid progress that has happened in generative modeling in the last few years. So the individual models are not very important. Um, so I'm just showing you samples. Uh, from models trained on data sets typical of that particular year. So we start in uh, 2014, where the typical data set was MNIST, which contained low dimensional images, uh, binary images of digits. Then one year later, there's been already some progress. And now we can have models that capture, to some degree, the distribution of natural images, still low dimensional, but now they're in color. And they're considerably more complicated than digits. The images are indeed blurry, but we can see some global shapes. And maybe some of these objects might be recognizable to you. And then four years later, uh, we can model much higher dimensional images uh, with uh, much better results. So these are not perfectly photorealistic, but the local detail is very convincing. And the global structure is quite good as well. There's clearly room for improvement, but it's, uh, it's a long way from the binary images of digits. So let's look at uh, the popular types of generative models in deep learning. You have seen actually many of these mentioned before in the preceding lectures in this series, so I'll just give a very brief overview. So, um, autoregressive models are uh, most prominent uh, for language modeling, where they're typically implemented using recurrent neural network or transformers. Then we have latent variable models, uh, which are subdivided into tractable, such as invertible or flow-based models, and intractable ones, like variational order encoders. And this is the kind of model we will cover in depth in this lecture. And finally, there are implicit models, uh, most notably generative adversarial networks and their variants. So let's look at each one of these types in slightly greater detail. So autoregressive models solve the problem of modeling the joint distribution of observations X by subdividing it into simpler subproblems. So instead of modeling P of X directly, we actually model the one dimensional conditional distributions corresponding to this joint distribution. The resulting model is tractable and can be easily trained using maximum likelihood. So why is this a good approach? Well, one dimensional distributions are actually quite easy to model because we can use the off the shelf classifier technology that has been very successful in deep learning. And such models are simple and efficient to train as we don't need to do any kind of sampling of random variables at training time. On the other hand, because we're modeling a sequence of dimensions of conditional distributions, sampling from such models is inherently a sequential process, which means it is slow. We have to go through one dimension at a time and we cannot easily parallelize this. The other weakness of such models is that they naturally focus on the local structure rather than global structure. 
So unless you build uh, some sort of inductive bias towards capturing the global structure into the model directly, you are likely to have less success with modeling the global structure with these models. Then we have latent variable models, which are um, also likelihood based, like autoregressive models, but they take a different approach to modeling the joint distribution. So they do it by introducing uh, the unobserved or latent variable that in some sense explains or generates the observation. So we start with the latent variable, and then we also define the transformation that maps the latent variable value to the particular observation. These models are also trained using maximum likelihood or uh, more typically some approximation to maximum likelihood because often maximum likelihood is intractable here. And latent variable models provide a very powerful and well understood framework, a mature framework that has been around for a long time in statistics. Uh, they make it really easy to incorporate uh, prior knowledge and various structure constraints into the model. So if you would like to model some sort of statistical or physical process, you have some ideas about how it's structured. This is typically the model type you will use. And because generally they don't use autoregressive or sequential subcomponents, sampling from such models is efficient. On the downside, these models require understanding the concept of inference, which is the reverse of generation. So this means going from the observation to the plausible latent values that could have generated it. So you need to understand and implement this concept in order to use these models. That makes them somewhat more complex than autoregressive models. And as I mentioned uh, previously, for many such models, inference is intractable. So either we have to introduce the additional complexity of using approximations for inference, or we have to restrict ourselves in what kind of models we can use in order to ensure that inference remains tractable. And the third class of popular generative models in deep learning are generative adversarial networks. And unlike the previous two types, these are not likelihood based. These are so-called implicit models because uh, they don't actually assign probabilities to observations. They just give you uh, samplers that generates observations. So the model here that we're training is simply a neural network that takes a vector of random numbers and maps it to the observation. And unlike the other two classes of generative models we just looked at, these models are trained uh, using adversarial training rather than maximum likelihood. So adversarial training works by introducing an auxiliary model, a classifier, that is trained to discriminate between samples from the generator, the model, and the training data. And the gradients from this classifier provide a learning signal that we can use to train the model or the generator. So the main appeal of these models is that they are by far uh, the best ones for modeling images. So the images they generate are extremely realistic. They are also relatively easy to understand conceptually because um, you don't need to understand the concept of inference, and you're training a model simply by backpropagating through a classifier. And like latent variable models, they provide fast generation because generating an observation involves simply performing a forward pass in a neural network. On the other hand, generative adversarial networks don't give us uh, the ability to assign probability to observations. So, this means that we can't use them for many applications of generative models, such as outlier detection or uh, lossless compression. They also suffer from so-called mode collapse. And this is um, the case when a model trained on the data set ignores some part of the training data and models only a subset of the training data, which is a bit worrisome and not something that you see with likelihood-based models, because they're essentially obligated to model every data point. And the other uh, difficulty with mode collapse is that we don't actually have control over which part of the data distribution will be ignored. On the other hand, if you just want realistic samples from some part of the data distribution, then GANs do it really well. And the other difficulty with GANs is that uh, optimization is actually uh, a subtle point optimization problem. 
And as a result, training is often unstable and requires a lot of small tricks to get it right. So in this lecture, we will uh, focus on latent variable models and inference. So let's look at this generative modeling framework. So a latent variable model defines an observation, uh, a distribution over observations x by introducing a latent variable z. Along with that, we specify its prior distribution, as well as the likelihood p of x given z that connects the latent variable to the observation. So p of x given z essentially tells us how to map a configuration of latent variable to a distribution over the observations. And even though I say a latent variable, typically z is a vector, or it can be a tensor or anything like that. Conceptually, it doesn't really make uh, much of a difference. So once we have the prior and the likelihood, we have specified the model completely. And the model is completely characterized by the joint distribution p of x comma z, which we obtain simply by multiplying the likelihood by the prior. And there are two distributions that we can derive from the joint distribution that will be of interest to us for latent variable modeling. So the first such distribution is p of x, which is the marginal likelihood of an observation. And it tells us how probable the observation is uh, under the model. And this is the quantity that we would optimize if we were doing maximum likelihood learning. And then there's the posterior distribution, p of z given x. And this is the distribution of plausible latent values that could have generated the given observation x. So we can think of the latent variable as some sort of explanation for the observation. So how do we generate observations from a latent variable model? It's uh, actually quite simple. We start by sampling the latent variable z from the prior p of z. And then we sample x from the likelihood distribution p of x given z which is conditional on the configuration of the latent variable. And much of this lecture will be concerned with inference, uh, which is the process of going back from the observation x to a distribution over the latent variable z. So in this lecture, inference will specifically refer to computing the posterior distribution given the observation. So computing p of z given x. How is p of z given x defined? Well, we simply use the definition of conditional probability, which says that p of z given x is the ratio of the joint distribution under the model, p of x comma z, divided by the marginal probability of x, p of x. So this means that in order to compute the posterior distribution, we first need to compute the marginal probability of x, p of x, or the marginal likelihood. How do we do that? Well, we do that by starting with the joint distribution p of x comma z and marginalizing out the latent variable z. In the continuous case, it will be integration. So we will integrate over z the joint distribution. In the discrete case, it will be a summation. But uh, typically, in this lecture, I will use integration. And now. We will see that inference is, uh, in a very specific formal sense, the inverse of generation. So let's think about two ways of generating the observation slash latent variable pairs, x, z. So one way to generate such pairs is to start by sampling the latent variable z from the prior, and then sampling the observation from the likelihood. This is uh, what we've done uh, two slides ago. This gives us a distribution of xz pairs. But we can also sample xz pairs in a different way. First, we can sample x from the model using the same process and then just discarding the original latent configuration that led to z. And now that we have this x, we can perform inference and sample a z from the posterior distribution for, it, for this x, from p of z given x. This gives us another way of generating pairs x and z. And because the product of the 
distributions we are sampling from in both cases is exactly the same. It's the joint distribution P of X comma Z. It means that the distribution of these pairs is exactly the same. So this means that uh, sampling from the uh, variational uh, from the exact posterior is a probabilistic inverse of uh, generation. So why is inference important? Well, inference is important in its own right because once we've trained the model, we can use inference to explain observations in terms of latent configurations. So it might potentially allow us to interpret observations in terms of some latent variable values. Moreover, as we will see a bit later, uh, inference comes up naturally in maximum likelihood training of latent variable models. It's a subproblem that we will need to solve over and over in the inner loop of optimization. So let's look at an example of inference in a very simple latent variable model, uh, a mixture of Gaussians. Uh, you have probably seen this uh, model before. It's perhaps the simplest latent variable model you can imagine. So it has a single latent variable. Uh, it's a discrete one, and it takes on k values between 1 and k. The probability of z being i is simply pi i. And then each latent variable value corresponds to a mixture component, which is Gaussian. And the mean and the standard deviation of this Gaussian is determined by the value of the mixing component. So we can think of this as having a vector of means and a vector of standard deviations for the mixing component. And then the latent variable simply selects which dimension of these vectors we will use to define the Gaussian. Let's compute the marginal likelihood or the marginal probability of the observation x. So as we saw before, this requires marginalizing out z from the joint of the model. And the joint is simply the product of the prior p of z and the likelihood p of x given z. Since it is a discrete model, we're performing summation to marginalize out z by summing over its values from 1 through k. Now that we have computed the marginal likelihood, we can compute the posterior distribution because p of z given x is just the ratio of the joint probability of x and z divided by the uh, marginal probability of x. And we computed the marginal probability above and the joint probability also as a subproblem there. So now we have an expression for the posterior probability of z given x. As you can see, we can compute this posterior distribution in linear time in the number of latent variable values. So this model is clearly very tractable. Now let's look at maximum likelihood learning, which is how we would like to train latent variable models. Maximum likelihood is a very well-established estimation principle for probabilistic models in statistics. And the, the basic idea behind it is that we should choose those parameters of the model that make the training data most probable. So this corresponds to uh, maximizing the product of probabilities of data points in the training set. Or for computational convenience, we can maximize the sum of log probabilities of the data points. Uh, because we're looking for the optimal parameters rather than the objective function value, these two approaches are exactly the same. They give us the same parameter values. Unfortunately, for latent variable models, we can't solve this optimization problem in closed form. So as a result, we use various iterative approaches, either uh, based on gradient descent or uh, expectation maximization. So let's look at the gradient of the marginal log likelihood for a single observation. So the gradient of log p of x is equal to, now we, re, uh, we recall that the derivative of log is its argument, derivative of its argument divided by the argument. So here we have the derivative of the marginal probability divided by the probability itself. Then we expand the marginal probability in terms of the joint distribution and integrate over the uh, latent value z, and we exchange the derivative and the integral. On the next line, we replace the derivative of the joint 
by the joint times the derivative of the log probability of the joint using the identity in the yellow box. And this is the same identity we used uh, on the first line of this derivation. Now that we have uh, reformulated the integral that way, we can see that we have a ratio of probability of the joint configuration xz divided by the probability of the marginal x. This corresponds to the posterior distribution p of z given x. So we rewrite it like that. And now we can see that uh, the gradient of the log uh, marginal probability is simply an expectation with respect to the posterior distribution of the gradients of the log joint. So this means that in order to compute the gradient of the log marginal probability, which is what we need for maximum likelihood estimation, we need to compute the posterior distribution somehow. So this is basically an essential subproblem. And the other thing we can see here is that the posterior probabilities don't, uh, modulate the gradient contributions from the log joint to the gradient of the marginal log likelihood. So it basically upweighs the configurations z that were more likely to generate this observation and downweigh the um, configurations that are less likely. So this basically means that inference performs credit assignments among latent configurations for the given observation. So unfortunately, exact inference is hard in general. Um, to see why this is, is the case, let's think about uh, computing the marginal likelihood of an observation, uh, which is, as we've seen, uh, an important part of computing the posterior distribution. So if our latent variables are continuous, then computing the marginal likelihood involves integrating over high dimensional space. And Typically, the argument we'll be integrating over will be a nonlinear function. So analytical integration will not be an option. And numerical integration, in order to get a reasonable level of accuracy, will also not be an option because uh, the complexity of integration will go exponentially uh, in the number of latent variables. In the discrete case, the situation is slightly better because now, instead of integrating over the latent configurations were summing over a finite number of them. So we know that we could conceivably enumerate all those configurations and compute the, um, the marginal probability like that. But the issue is uh, the same as in the continuous case, the curse of dimensionality. So if the number of latent variables is uh, more than a handful, then the number of possible joint latent configurations will be so large that we will never be able to compute this sum exactly. There are some exceptions uh, where we have interesting models with exact inference. And we've seen um, with, with exact tractable inference. We've already seen one example. Uh, it's, a, it's a mixture model where inference is basically linear in the number of mixing components. Uh, the other important subclass is linear Gaussian models. So these are models with Gaussian latent variables and linear mappings. In these models, all the induced distributions are Gaussian, and as a result, uh, inference is tractable. And finally, we have the interesting case of invertible models. Uh, so these models are special because they're actually quite powerful, and yet they allow exact inference through clever constraints on their structure. And we will see these models a bit later in this lecture. So how can we avoid these intractable computations that exact inference involves? Well, there are two general strategies here. The first one is simply to restrict ourselves when designing the model so that the resulting model will be tractable. This will give us easier training because we can do exact maximum likelihood without any approximations, but it will make model design more complicated and in a sense, considerably restrict uh, the modeling choices we can make. On the other hand, um, if we're interested in creating a model that represents our knowledge about the task, then we might want to just build the model with, uh, you know, all the required properties that we would like, and then worry about the inference later. 
And almost certainly, we will end up with an intractable model. But that's OK, because there are approximate inference methods. And we will be willing to pay the price of uh, using an approximate inference with some extra complexity that that entails. But then we will be able to use more expressive models. So let's look at the first strategy uh, of working with tractable models and exact inference. So we will look at uh, these modern tractable but very powerful models called invertible models, also known as normalizing flows. And they're special and in interesting because they combine high expressive power with tractability, which is rather rare. And the basic idea behind these models is simply uh, starting with some prior distribution, like in any latent variable models, and then applying an invertible function to it to obtain the observation. And the parameters of the model are all incorporated in this invertible function. And by warping the prior distribution in various ways, we can approximate the data distribution. So because the function is invertible, this constrains the structure of the model in a very specific way and makes inference and maximum likelihood uh, tractable in these models. So let's look at the uh, generative description of an invertible model. Uh, so to specify an invertible model, we need the prior distribution as before, p of z. And to, here we will assume that it has no parameters, but it doesn't make much difference. Um, this is just for convenience. And then we use an invertible differentiable transformation f of z, which has parameters theta, to transform samples from the prior into observations. So all the model parameters here will be in this uh, function f. And because we use f that's invertible, having this setup gives us one-to-one -one correspondence between latent configurations and observations. So there's absolutely no ambiguity about which latent configuration generated the given observation because the function is one-to-one. Uh, -one. So this means that we can simply compute uh, the latent configuration by inverting f and ap applying it to x. So we apply f inverse to the observation, and we exactly recover the only latent configuration that could have generated this observation. So this is uh, very nice. Inference is very easy and fully deterministic. So now, how do we compute uh, the marginal likelihood we need for maximum likelihood training? Uh, to do that, uh, we need to somehow relate the prior probability and the probability of the observation x. And it turns out that uh, because we use an invertible differential transformation to connect z to x, we can apply the change of variables uh, formula. And then the densities, the probability of p of z and p of x differ by just a, a scaling factor. And this scaling factor is the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian of the mapping from x to z. This might seem a bit um, counterintuitive or surprising, Why, where does this factor come from? And this factor simply accounts for the fact that when we apply a function to go from uh, z to x from, or x to z, it will change the infinitesimal volume around the point where it's being applied. And so if we want the resulting distribution to normalize to 1, just like the original distribution, we need to take into account that volume rescaling factor. And this is exactly what the uh, determinant of the Jacobian takes into account. So we would like to get rid of z in that expression because we want to evaluate um, probability of x just on data points x. And we can get rid of x by remembering that we can get rid of z by remembering that z is simply f inverse of x. So wherever we have z, we replace it with f inverse of x. And now we have an expression for the probability of x that makes no reference to z. So now, um, conceptually at least, we can compute the marginal probability of x, and we can perform maximum likelihood training. Uh, so 
from the practical uh, angle, uh, to do maximum likelihood estimation, we still need to have some requirements for f. So in particular, we need to be able to compute f inverse of x, as well as a determinant of its Jacobian, because it's used in the expression of the marginal probability of x. And we also need to compute their gradients, because that this is what's required for maximum likelihood estimation. And finally, uh, these uh, computations need to be sufficiently efficient for maximum likelihood to be fast. So let's look at a very simple invertible model, perhaps the simplest and uh, maybe the oldest, uh, called the independent component analysis. So this model starts with a factorial prior. So each latent dimension is modeled as a univariate distribution, independently of the other dimensions. And the latent values are mapped to the observation using a square matrix A. So this is a linear model. Since inference in an invertible model in, involves inverting F, inference here is simply multiplying by the inverse of A. So to compute Z from X, we simply multiply X by A inverse. And once we've trained such a model, we can use it to explain our observations in terms of uh, latent independent causes that explain the data linearly. And uh, the typical application for this model is uh, solving the so-called cocktail party problem, where you have n sound sources around the room, for example, people talking. And then you also have n sensors and microphones. And you would like to isolate individual people from this mixed recording. And because sound acoustics uh, ensures that mixing is approximately linear, this is a, an appropriate model. So inference uh, on uh, recordings from microphones X will allow us to recover uh, individual sources Z. And in order for this to uh, identify independent sources, uh, there's an interesting constraint. The prior cannot be Gaussian because Gaussian latent variables are um, rotationally symmetric in high dimensions. So we cannot actually recover independence. We can only recover decorrelation. So typically, the prior we use here is some sort of heavy tail distribution, like a logistic or Cauchy. So how do we construct general invertible models? Well, the strategy is simple because a combination or composition of invertible transformations is invertible. We simply uh, use a library of simple invertible transformations and chain a lot of them together to obtain a more expressive invertible transformation. And here, each of these uh, simple building blocks uh, can be parameterized either in the forward direction, mapping from Z to X, or in the reverse direction from X to Z, whichever one we would like to be more efficient when uh, using the model. So depending whether we want training or inference to be more efficient, we parameterize the appropriate mapping. And one interesting uh, detail here is that we don't actually need F to be analytically invertible. It is fine if F can be inverted only numerically with an iterative algorithm, as long as we have a reasonably efficient algorithm that, require, that recovers the inverse to numerical precision. And in terms of building blocks, there's a rapidly growing list of them. This is an active area of research. And I give uh, a few examples there on the slide. So invertible models are uh, very appealing because they are both powerful and they're tractable, so easy to train. So why don't we use them all the time? Well they do have a number of limitations uh, which make them not always appropriate. So one obvious limitation is that the dimensionality of the latent vector and of the observations has to be the same. And this is a consequence of requiring the function f to be invertible. There's no way around it. So if we would like a lower dimensional latent space for some sort of uh, low dimensional representation of the observation, we simply can't easily do this with an invertible model. Uh, the other requirement is that the latent space has to be continuous. Uh, 
And this is because we use change of density to compute the marginal probability of x. There has been some initial work on discrete flows. So this um, limitation might be relaxed in, in the future. The other consequence of using la continuous latent variables and applying an invertible uh, transformation to them is that it makes it hard to model discrete data because the output of such a transformation will also be a density. So unless our observations are continuous or quantized, which means that they were discretized based on some underlying continuous distributions, we can't really apply invertible models to such data. And because the models are constructed by chaining a lot of simple transformation together, the resulting models tend to be quite large in order to have high expressive power. So this means that we will need to store a lot of activations and parameters, which makes it easy to run out of GPU memory when training such models. So in terms of expressiveness per parameter or per um, you know, kilobyte of memory, these models are less expressive than more general latent variable models. And finally, uh, compared to general latent variable models, it's hard to incorporate structure in uh, invertible models because we have to retain invertibility. So that removes a lot of options for model design. On the other hand, because invertible models are tractable and powerful, they make very uh, useful building blocks to incorporate into other models, in particular, intractable latent variable models. They provide a very useful abstraction uh, that basically gives you a distribution that can be trained exactly and gives you the exact marginal likelihood. So that makes them very composable and appealing as uh, building blocks. In the second half of the lecture, we will look at intractable models and variational inference as a way of training them. So why would we want to use intractable models? Well, sometimes the, the structure of the model or its uh, latent variable have some sort of intrinsic meaning for us. We might be modeling some real world process and the underlying quantities uh, have some grounded uh, meaning. And we would like to structure the model in a particular way that captures that. So this is different from thinking of a model as just some sort of black box that produces uh, predictions or merely generates samples. So we want some sort of interpretability. Then the basic question is, uh, and I like this quote from David Bly. Do you want the wrong answer to the right question? Or do you want the right answer to the wrong question? And this basically highlights the dilemma we have. Do we want to use the right model with approximate inference or uh, potentially the wrong model with exact inference? And in many situations, when we take modeling quite seriously, it makes sense to go for the wrong answer to the right question. So in many cases, we will end up with an intractable model that captures our desired properties, and we will just have to use approximate inference. Uh, so here's an example of how easy it is to end up with an intractable model, even though the starting point is tractable. So as we've seen, the ICA model, with the same number of latent dimensions as observation dimensions, is uh, tractable. It's a very simple linear model. So what would happen if we change this model slightly? Suppose we would like to model a bit of observation noise to indicate that our microphones are not perfect. So adding observation to the model makes the model intractable because the mapping is no longer invertible. If we use more latent dimensions and observations, the model once again becomes intractable. And even if we use fewer dimensions than observations, observation dimensions, the model becomes intractable once again. So it really doesn't take much to go from a simple tractable model to an intractable one. And once we have an intractable model, in order to use it or train it, we need to use approximate inference. And there are two broad classes of approximate inference. Uh, the first class is, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And here we will represent our exact posterior using samples from it, but using exact samples. 
And to obtain an exact sample from the true posterior, we set up a Markov chain, which we run for quite some time. And at some point, it converges to the right distribution, which is the true posterior. And then the sample from it is a sample from the true posterior. So the advantage of this method is that it's very general. We really don't uh, need to restrict our model essentially in any way. We can use Markov chain Monte Carlo for inference. And this method is also um, exact in the limit of essentially infinite time and computation. So we, if we spend enough time generating samples, uh, they will be from the right distribution. If we generate enough samples, we will basically have our answer to the arbitrary degree of precision. So in some sense, this is the gold standard for inference. Unfortunately, in practice, it's very computationally expensive. Uh, and so doing Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, is not really an option in many cases. Also, convergence, actually knowing when we are sampling from the right distribution is really hard to diagnose. So often, we just wait for some time until we're tired of waiting. And then we use the sample at that point, hoping that it's from the right distribution. But doing this can actually introduce a subtle error because it might still not be the true posterior that we're sampling from. And we have no way of quantifying or controlling for this. So the other class of approximate inference methods is uh, variational inference. And here, the idea is rather different. Um, instead of sampling from the true posterior in some free form, we say we will approximate the true posterior with their distribution um, with some particular simple structure. So for example, we will say we will approximate the true posterior with a factorized distribution, which models each latent dimension independently. So, and then we fit this approximation to the true posterior using optimization. The advantage of this approach is that it's much more efficient than Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, as optimization is generally more efficient than sampling. Uh, on the other hand, um, we cannot trade computation for greater accuracy as easily, because once we've chosen the form of this uh, posterior approximation, uh, once we've converged, running for longer doesn't give us any more accuracy. But unlike in Markov chain Monte Carlo, we uh, have something that guarantees uh, that we're performing reasonably well at every point because we have a bound on the marginal log likelihood. So we can essentially, at least hypothetically, quantify the approximation error. So let's look at variational inference in detail. So the one line description of variational inference is it turns inference into an optimization problem. And it's called variational because we're essentially optimizing over a space of uh, distributions. Uh, and as a result, we're approximating some unknown posterior distribution with a uh, distribution from some particular family. And the distribution that we'll be approximating the exact posterior will be called the variational posterior. We will denote it as q of z given x. Uh, and it will have parameters phi, which are called the variational parameters. And they're there just to make sure that our variational posterior approximates the true posterior, p of z given x, as accurately as possible. Uh, and what are the restrictions on the choice of the variational posterior? Well, uh, our hands are pretty much free as long as we can sample from this distribution, and we can compute the probabilities, the log probabilities under it, and the corresponding parameter gradients that we need in order to fit this distribution to the true posterior. So a classic and default choice is simply using the fully factorized distribution Q, where each dimension is modeled independently from all others. Variational inference allows us to train models by approximating uh, the marginal log likelihood, which in itself is intractable because the model is intractable. So we can't compute the marginal log likelihood. But by introducing this um, simplified form of the variational posterior allows us to define an alternative objective, which is closely related to the marginal log likelihood. And this objective is a lower bound on the marginal log likelihood. And we train the model by optimizing this lower bound with respect to the parameters of the model phi and the parameters of the variational posterior uh, phi. Uh, 
sorry, parameters of the model theta and the parameters of the variational posterior phi. And because this is a lower bound, it's guaranteed to be below the value of the marginal log likelihood. So when we maximize the lower bound, we're usually also pushing up the marginal log likelihood, even though we can't actually compute it exactly. So how do we obtain this variational lower bound on the marginal log likelihood? So let's consider any density Q of Z. Um, as, uh, the only requirement is that this density is non-negative whenever the prior distribution is non-negative. Then we start by exp expanding the marginal log likelihood in terms of the joint distribution where we integrate over the latent variable. And then we introduce this density that we uh, chose by both multiplying and dividing the uh, model joint by it. So this doesn't do anything because multiplying and dividing by the same quantity has no effect. But once we've done this, we can apply the Jensen inequality, which states that the log of the expectation of some function is always greater than or equal than the expectation of the log of this particular function. So this allows us to push the log inside the integral uh, and take the integral with q outside the log. And we know that the resulting quantity is, le is less than or equal to the preceding quantity because of the Jensen inequality. And now we recognize that this uh, new expression is simply, simply the expectation with respect to this distribution Q that we introduced of log density ratio between the joint distribution P of X Z and this density. And the important thing to recognize is that because this density Q that we used in this derivation is arbitrary, uh, for any setting of parameters of the density phi, we will have a lower bound on the marginal log likelihood, which basically allows us to get uh, as tight of a bound as possible simply by maximizing this expression with respect to the parameters phi, and thus getting a closer approximation to the marginal log likelihood. So there are several uh, possible variational lower bounds. And in this lecture, we will focus on essentially the bound we derived on the previous page, where instead of the arbitrary density Q, we will use the variational posterior Q of Z given X. And this is both the simplest and by far the most widely used variational bound. So uh, this is the bound you will see in most variational uh, inference papers. Uh, there is a more recent option called the importance weighted lower bound, also known for historical reasons as i way And this is uh, simply a multi-sample generalization of the evidence lower bound. And it's uh, interesting feature is that uh, it allows you to control the tightness of the bound, uh, the accuracy of approximation to the marginal likelihood by increasing the number of samples you use in the bound. So this is not quite as flexible as Markov chain Monte Carlo, where you uh, use more computation to get more accurate results, because uh, the scaling is, uh, you know, you get rapid improvement as you go from one sample to 10 samples. But once you go beyond that, the improvement quickly levels out. But still, you can get some easy gains without changing the form of the variational posterior. But uh, for simplicity, we will use the elbow in the rest of this lecture. So let's review uh, a concept important for variational inference. And this concept is Kalbeck-Liebler divergence. Uh, KL divergence provides us with a way of quantifying the difference between two distributions. Um, and uh, KL divergence uh, between Q and P is defined as the expectation under the distribution Q of the log density ratio of Q to P. And it has a few important properties we will need for the rest of the lecture. So first of all, uh, the KL divergence is uh, non-negative for any choice of Q and P. The KL divergence is zero if and only if Q and P are the same almost everywhere. So we can basically think Q and P are the same distribution is the only case when the KL divergence is zero. And finally, it's important to remember that KL divergence is not a metric. So it's not symmetric in its arguments. So KL from Q to P is not the same as 
KL from P to Q in general. So let's look at uh, optimizing a variational lower bound with respect to the variational parameters phi of the variational posterior Q. So let's start by rewriting the elbow. Uh, so in, on the first line, we factor the joint distribution into the marginal probability of x and the posterior probability of z given x. This is just another factorization of the joint uh, density of the model. Uh, on the next line, we simply take out the term for the marginal uh, log likelihood into the first term and then keep the rest as the second term giving us expectation under Q of the log density of the true posterior to the variational posterior. Now, in, in the first expectation on that line, we see that log P of X actually does not depend on Z. So its expectation under the variational posterior is just itself. So log P of X. And then we recognize the second quantity, a second expectation simply as the minus KL from the variational posterior Q of Z given X to the true posterior P of Z given X. So let's look at that uh, decomposition of the variational lower bound. So we have two terms, the marginal log likelihood and the KL. So the marginal log likelihood depends on the model parameters theta, but it does not depend on the variational parameters phi. So when we uh, maximize the variational lower bound to the with respect to the variational parameters phi, the first term is unaffected. So therefore, Maximizing the elbow with respect to variational parameters is the same as minimizing the KL divergence from the variational posterior to the true posterior. And this KL from the variational posterior to the true posterior quantifies the distance from the variational posterior to the true posterior. And it is known as the variational gap because we can express it also as the difference between the marginal log likelihood, log P of X, and the variational bound L of X. So this means that when we are maximizing the elbow with, with respect to the variational parameters, we're actually minimizing the KL divergence from the variational posterior to the true posterior. So we're making sure that variational posterior is a better and better fit to the true posterior. This is actually remarkable because this, uh, this is a model which is intractable. So we cannot actually compute the true posterior at all. And we can't even compute the scale divergence from the variational posterior to the true posterior because it involves the true posterior, which we can't compute in the first place. So if we look at that decomposition of elbow from the previous slide as the difference between the log marginal likelihood and the KL from the variational to the true posterior, we realize that the elbow is actually a difference between two intractable quantities, and yet it is tractable. So it means that both of these quantities are intractable in the same way. So they have this intractable part that's exactly the same. And we, when we take the difference between them, it cancels out. Also looking at this decomposition and remembering that the KL divergence is non-negative, and it's zero if and only if the two distributions are effectively the same. It means that uh, the best value of the variational lower bound we can get is actually the same as the marginal log likelihood, log P of X. And that happens when the KL is zero. And this can only happen if Q is a, a very expressive distribution that can approximate the true posterior exactly. So that's good for understanding variational inference, but in practice, it's not going to happen with the variational model. Now let's think about maximizing the variational bound with respect to the other set of parameters, the model parameters. What happens when we update these parameters to increase the variational lower bound? Well, looking at the same decomposition, we see that, uh, well, either the first term, the marginal log likelihood, will increase, or the second term will have to decrease. That's the only way to get the increase in the uh, variational lower bound. So let's look at the first option. Um, when we update the parameters and the marginal log likelihood increases, this is good because 
this is the same as what maximum likelihood learning uh, parameter update does. We're increasing the marginal log likelihood. But what happens when the variational lower bound is increased because we actually decreased the variational gap? Well, there are two ways of decreasing the variational gap. Uh, so we've seen the first one uh, a couple of slides ago uh, when we were updating the variational parameters. And because that was equivalent to uh, minimizing the KL from the variational posterior to the true posterior, that was decreasing the variational gap as well. And doing this was clearly good because we were getting a better and better approximation uh, for the variational posterior of the true posterior. And the model was not affected by uh, these updates because the model is not affected by the variational parameters. On the other hand, now, if we update the model parameters and the variational gap decreases, uh, it, uh, it means uh, that the model has changed. So the way in which it changed, uh, there are two possibilities. So first of all, the inference in this model, variational inference in this model did become more accurate because the variational posterior remained the same, but the true posterior moved towards it. So now they are closer together. But when this happens, this is actually not always desirable because it means we're spending some of the model capacity to actually approximate the variational posterior rather than to model the data. So in a sense, the model is trying to contort itself so that inference in it is easy. And if we only have so much capacity in the model, it will probably make it less good of a model of the data. So this means that if we are worried by such effects, if we would like to have as um, faithful approximation to maximum likelihood as possible, we should use as expressive of a variational posterior as possible, because this will reduce the variational gap and there will be less of a pressure for the model to uh, distort itself like that. And one particular manifestation um, of this uh, effect in uh, model strand using variational inference is called variational pruning. And this is uh, when the model refuses to use some of the latent variables. So they're essentially not used to generate the data, which means that their posterior and their prior are exactly the same. And when I say posterior, I mean both the true posterior and the variational posterior, because when the model is unused, uh, its true posterior is the same as the prior, and it's very easy to approximate with the variational posterior. And this is, in fact, why variational pruning happens, because when you prune out some variables, uh, it becomes easier uh, to perform variational inference. So there's this extra pressure on the model to be simpler in that way. And variational pruning is also known as posterior collapse in the variational autoencoder literature. So is variational pruning a good thing or a bad thing? Well. Uh, it depends how you think about it. In some circumstances, it can be a good thing because you can think of it as choosing the dimensionality of the latent space automatically based on your data distribution. On the other hand, um, it gives away, it takes away some of our freedom to overfit to the data. So sometimes uh, in deep learning, you would like to have a very accurate model of the training data, even if you're, when you're not concerned with overfitting. And you can easily achieve this by giving the model many, many hidden units. So making the hidden layers wider. And then you are guaranteed to overfit to the data, often driving like classification error to zero. Well, if you're training a generative model and you would like to achieve something similar, uh, overfitting to the data arbitrarily well by giving it lots and lots of latent variables, well, if you're using variational inference, the model will actually refuse to use extra variables after some point. And the number of variables it will uh, use can be surprisingly small. And uh, sometimes it's clearly suboptimal. So you would like the model to use more variables, but because the variation posterior is uh, too simple compared to the true posterior, it will simply disregard the rest of the latent variables. And how do we choose uh, the form of the variational posterior? Well, the default choice, as I uh, mentioned before, is a fully factorized distribution with each dimension modeled independently. And this uh, form is known as the mean field approximation for historical reasons, because the method originated in physics. We can make the variational distribution more expressive 
Uh, and we have several choices for doing that. So one possibility is to use a mixture model. So instead of a unimodal distribution, we will have a multimodal distribution now. Uh, if we're using a variational posterior that's a diagonal Gaussian, which is a very common choice, we can introduce a richer covariance structure. So we can, for example, have a low rank or a full covariance Gaussian as a variational posterior. We can make the variational posterior autoregressive, uh, which will make training more expensive like many of the other choices, but will provide much more modeling power. Or alternatively, we can uh, take an invertible model and use it to parameterize the variational posterior as well. And this works very nicely because variational models are tractable. And ultimately, we're making this trade-off between uh, the computational cost of training the model and the quality of the variational approximation and perhaps fit to the data, on the other hand. Uh, some of these uh, choices for the more expressive posteriors also have some practical downsides because you might run into numerical instability problems. So you have to be uh, careful and watch out for that. Um, and sometimes when you use a richer variational posterior, you actually get worse results. And uh, this should not happen in theory if optimization is perfect, but due to various stability issues and learning dynamics issues, this can actually happen. All right, so let's... Um, think about what we're doing when we're fitting a variational distribution. So first of all, the posterior distribution, of course, is different for every observation x, because uh, each x is generated by uh, some latent configuration that's more probable than others. So we have a distribution of our plausible explanations for x. This means that we need to fit a different variational posterior for each observation. And in classical variational inference, this means that we simply have a separate set of distribution parameters for each observation that we optimize over. And this also means that we perform a separate optimization uh, run for each data point, whether it's a training observation or a test observation, to fit the corresponding variational parameters. This can be inefficient because basically the, we learn nothing from fitting variational parameters for one data point about all the other data points. So we can actually amortize this cost by replacing this separate optimization procedure for each data point with some sort of functional approximation. So we will train a neural network that will take the observation and output an approximation to its variational parameters. And we will train this network, which we'll call the inference network, uh, to basically to serve as the approximation to all those independent variational posteriors we were training before. And as a result now, instead of performing uh, potentially costly iterative optimization for each data point to obtain its posterior, we simply perform a forward pass in the inference network that gives us the variational parameters. And these are the ones that we use for the variational posterior. So now we replaced all these independent variational parameters that were data point specific with a single set of neural network parameters that are shared between all observations. And we amortize the cost of solving these optimization problems among all observations. So once we've trained such an inference network, we can uh, compute the variational posterior for a new data point simply by feeding the data point to the network, and it will produce the corresponding variational posterior. So this is a very powerful idea because it allows us to easily scale up variational inference to much bigger data sets and models than before. And this idea of amortized inference was introduced uh, in the context of Helmholtz machines in, in the mid 90s. And it was popularized recently by variational autoencoders that rely on it. And as mentioned before, the variational parameters are trained uh, jointly with the model parameters simply by maximizing the elbow with respect to both. And now we basically have two sets of neural network parameters, one for the model and one for the inference network. Let's step back and think about what we gained and what we gave up by uh, performing variational inference. Well, now um, we can train intractable models in a principled way and relatively efficiently. This uh, lets us choose any kind of model we want and incorporate any kind of prior knowledge into the model. So that's great from the modeling standpoint. And inference is quite fast, especially if we use amortization compared to MCMC methods. 
So some models uh, are simply infeasible uh, for MCMC, and variational inference makes it possible to train them. And what did we lose? Well, we do typically give up some of the model capacity uh, because we're not using uh, expressive enough variational posterior. But perhaps that's fine because essentially, in many cases, variational inference is the only option for training a model this large on a data set of a particular size. So we either have a slightly suboptimal fit, or uh, we have to resort to a much simpler model. So we saw that uh, training a model using variational inference requires computing the gradients of the variational lower bound with respect to the model parameters. Uh, theta and the variational parameters phi. Well, the elbow is actually an expectation. So computing gradients of, the, of an expectation might not be so straightforward. So let's look at how we can do this. Well, in classic variational inference, um, the expectations were typically computed in closed form, and then optimization uh, did not involve any kind of uh, noise in the gradient estimates because the objective function was analytically tractable. On the other hand, to actually have expectations that you can compute in a closed form required models to be very simple, as well as the variational posteriors to be generally fully factorized, because otherwise you couldn't compute the expectations. So variational inference in its classic form was applicable to only a small uh, set of models. On the other hand, uh, recent uh, developments in variational inference uh, replaced uh, exact estimation of the gradients with Monte Carlo-based estimation. And here, we don't try to compute the expectation or its gradients in closed form. Instead, we use Monte Carlo sampling from the variation and posterior to estimate it. And that gives us much more freedom in terms of what kind of models we can handle. And the answer is, uh, essentially, we can handle almost any kind of latent variable model. So let's look at how we can estimate the gradients of the elbow with respect to the model parameters. This is actually the easy case. So expanding the definition of the elbow there, we see that only the joint distribution of the model depends on the model parameters inside the expectation, and the variational posterior does not depend on it. Also, the expectation uh, the elbow involves is an expectation with respect to the variational posterior, which does not depend on the model parameters. This means we can safely move the gradient inside the expectation. And this means that the gradient of the elbow with respect to the model parameters is simply the expectation under the variational posterior of the gradient of the log joint for the model. And this quantity is really easy to estimate. We simply sample from the variational posterior, evaluate the gradients of the log joint, based on the resulting samples, and then we average them. And in practice, uh, even one sample can be enough to train a model. Uh, so one thing to mention here is, since we're using sampling to estimate gradients, there is some noise in the gradient estimates. And basically, gradient uh, estimate noise can be a bad thing because it prevents us from using larger learning rates. So if the noise level is too high, we have to use a sufficiently low learning rate to avoid divergence, which make, makes training models slower. So generally, we would like to have gradient estimates that are uh, relatively low variance. Increasing the number of samples we take is an easy way of reducing this variance. Now let's look at the case of the gradient for the variational parameters. This is a more complicated situation because now the gradient we're computing it involves the parameters of the distribution the expectation is over. So we can simply take the gradient inside the expectation because this will result in uh, incorrect estimates. So what do we do here? Well, it turns out that um, gradients of expectation of this form, computing them is a well-known a research problem, and there are several good methods for estimating these gradients available. So let's look at the two major types of unbiased gradient estimators uh, of such expectations. 
So here we will look at the general case of an expectation of a function f. In, uh, in variational inference, this f will be just uh, log density ratio of the joint to the variational posterior. So the first uh, type of the gradient estimator is called reinforce or likelihood ratio estimator. And it's, uh, it's very general. So it can handle both discrete and contiguous latent variables. And it does not uh, place uh, any stringent requirements on the function f that it can handle. So f can be non-differentiable. So that's nice. It's a very general estimator. The price to pay for this is that the resulting gradient estimates are relatively high variance. So unless you perform some additional variance reduction, uh, in almost all practical situations, uh, you need to use an extremely tiny learning rate. So this is essentially infeasible. So using reinforce without uh, variance reduction is essentially hopeless. Um, the other type of estimator is called reparameterization or passwise estimator. And this estimator is considerably less general. It requires us to use uh, continuous latent variables, and it supports only some continuous latent variable distributions. But the class is quite large. It also requires the function inside the expectation to be differentiable. But this is fine because in variational inference, this is typically the kind of function that we get. But the big advantage of this estimator is that out of the box, it gives you fairly low gradient variance. So you don't need to worry too much about variance reduction. And you can still estimate the gradients with sufficiently low variance and train the model sufficiently quickly. So let's look at the reparameterization trick, which is essentially how uh, passwise gradients are known in the modern machine learning literature. And the high level idea here is simply to take the parameters of the distribution the expectation is with respect to and somehow move them outside the distribution and inside the expectation. And once we've done that, we're in the same situation as for the gradient of the model parameters for elbow, because now the distribution of the expectation will not have the parameters we're differentiating with respect too, so we can just take the gradient inside. So how do we achieve this? We do this by reparameterizing samples from the distribution Q of Z. And we do that by thinking of them as a transformation of samples from some fixed distribution with no parameters. We will call these samples epsilon. And then we will apply some uh, deterministic differentiable transformation to it we will call G. Uh, that will incorporate the dependence on the parameters into the sample. So epsilon that comes from P of epsilon does not depend on any parameters. But once we transform it using G epsilon phi, uh, Z now depends on the parameters phi through this function G. So we factored out the randomness from the samples uh, and the parameters into separate boxes. So now we, that we've done this uh, factorization, we can rewrite the expectation of uh, f uh, with respect to distribution q in terms of uh, g. So now we replace z inside as the argument of f with g epsilon phi, because that's how we compute z. And because we generate z by sampling from p of epsilon, now the expectation is with respect to epsilon rather than z. So now, the expectation is with respect to a distribution that does not depend on the variational parameters. So we can now safely take the gradient with respect to phi inside the expectation. And now we compute the gradient of f of g with respect to phi by using the chain rule and remembering that g of epsilon phi is simply z. So then we evaluate the gradient of f at z, where z is equal to g epsilon phi, and then multiply it by the gradient of sample z as a function of parameters phi. And this expectation has the same form um, as the gradient of the elbow with respect to the model parameters. So we can estimate it by sampling from the uh, distribution p epsilon and averaging the gradients over the samples. And we get a low variance gradient estimate like that. So. Um, as I explained before, reparameterization trick essentially moves the dependence on the parameters of the distribution from the distribution itself uh, into its samples and thus inside the expectation. 
The main requirement um, here is that the resulting mapping that takes epsilon to z has to be differentiable with respect to the parameters phi, because when we uh, factor out the randomness and the parameters into two separate bits, we're essentially propagating gradients through z and into the function and its parameters. So let's see how we can reparameterize the one-dimensional Gaussian random variable z that comes from a distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Well, if we start with a standard normal epsilon, uh, we can scale it by sigma and then add the mean mu, and then we get exactly the right distribution for z. So we can see that the mapping that we use, mu plus sigma epsilon, is differentiable with respect to both mu and epsilon, so it satisfies the, the requirements of reparameterization. So this is a valid reparameterization. And this is how Gaussians are reparameterized in practice. So what about other distributions? So many distributions, um, such as those in the location scale family, such as Laplace uh, and Cauchy, can be reparameterized in exactly the same way, or some simple generalization of this approach. For some other dis continuous distributions, such as Gamma and Dirichlet, there's actually no way to factor out randomness uh, out of parameter dependence. So we can separate these things too. But there is a generalization of reparameterization called implicit reparameterization that still allows us to propagate gradients through samples from such distributions. On the other hand, there are some continuous distributions that cannot be reparameterized, and all discrete distributions cannot be reparameterized. Uh, for the simple reason that even though we can factor out randomness and parameter dependence, the function that we end up with is not differentiable. So applying a reparameterization trick will not give us the right gradients. The good news is if you want to use reparameterization for continuous distributions, uh, modern uh, deep learning frameworks such as TensorFlow and PyTorch implement this for you. So all you have to do is to pass the flag that you want your sample reparameterized when you're generating it from one of the standard distributions, and uh, automatic differentiation will take care of everything. So implementing variational inference this way now is very easy. So now let's look at perhaps the most successful application of variational inference uh, in recent years, uh, and that's uh, variational autoencoders. So variational autoencoders are simply generative models with continuous latent variables, where both the likelihood, p of x given z, and the variational posterior are parameterized using neural networks. Uh, typically, the prior and the variational posterior are modeled as fully factorized Gaussians, and VAEs are trained using variational inference by maximizing the elbow using both amortized inference and the reparameterization trick. And this combination uh, of using expressive mappings for the likelihood and the variational posterior and amortized inference and reparameterization uh, made VAEs very popular because they are highly scalable and yet expressive models. So let's look at a slightly more detailed description of a variational autoencoder. So we start with a prior uh, P of Z, which is typically a standard normal. And then our decoder, which is another term for likelihood in uh, VAE speak, will simply be either a neural network computing the parameters of a Bernoulli distribution, if we're modeling binary data, or a neural network computing the mean and the diagonal variance of a Gaussian distribution if we are modeling real value data. And for the variational posterior, once again, we use a neural network that outputs the parameters of the variational posterior after taking the observation x as the input. And the type of the neural network we use to parameterize these models doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the mathematical structure of the model. So you can easily use ConvNets, ResNets, or any kind of neural network you would like. Uh, and when uh, training VAEs, the elbow is typically written in a slightly different way from the one that we've seen before. So the elbow is decomposed into two tractable terms this time. So the first term is the expectation uh, over the variational posterior of log p of x given z. So this is log likelihood. 
And the second term is just minus the KL divergence from the variational posterior to the prior. Uh, because here, the second argument is the prior rather than the true posterior. This can actually be computed. And in fact, this is often computed in closed form, uh, which is easy to do for a distribution such as Gaussians. So the first uh, term essentially measures how well can we predict or reconstruct the given observation after sampling from its uh, variational posterior. And this term is typically known as the negative reconstruction error. So uh, high values of it are good. The second term, we can think of it as a regularizer that pushes the variational posterior towards the prior to make sure that we put not too much information into the latent variables in order to reconstruct the observation as well. And this scale is essentially uh, an upper bound on the amount of information about the observation we have in the latent variables under the variational posterior. So the VE uh, model has been around for quite a few years, and it has been extended in many, many ways. So now it's really more of a framework than an actual model. So VE as so a framework generally means that this is a model with continuous latent variables trained using amortized variational inference and the reparameterization trick. And the extensions that have been uh, discovered for VAEs uh, are numerous. So for example, here I covered only a single latent layer. Well, you can have multiple latent layers. You can have uh, latent variables that are non-Gaussian. Uh, you can have much more expressive priors and posteriors. So for example, you can use uh, invertible models for both. Um, you can use richer neural networks, for example, ResNets, or you can have autoregressive uh, likelihood terms so that you combine uh, some of the properties of autoregressive models with latent variable models. And people have also worked on improving variational inference, either by making it slightly closer to classic variational inference instead of one shot, uh, making it slightly iterative, where you do only a couple of updates. And also, people have worked on variance reduction in order to get lower variance gradients so we can train the models faster. So to conclude, uh, this lecture has covered two modern approaches to powerful latent variable models, uh, which are both based on likelihoods. And they make rather different decisions about uh, what's important, uh, whether it's exact inference or freedom in model design. And this classification of models into these different types um, is useful for um, uh, presentation purposes, but some of the most interesting work is actually about combining models of different types, which allows you to uh, basically take advantage of their complementary strengths. So I mentioned, for example, using autoregressive uh, decoders in variational autoencoders. You can also use autoregressive posteriors and so on. Um, and you get uh, the kind of ex extra modeling power of autoregressive distributions, and yet you still retain potential interpretability with latent variables. And what's exciting about this area is that it's still relatively new and developing very rapidly. So there are many uh, substantial contributions that uh, remain to be made. <laughs>